<clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor George. <laughs> Thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm honored, really, to be here. Um, I've uh, heard of uh, the center since it was started. And I'm very happy to come and to participate uh, to the measure that I can, uh, and to meet the people who are involved. <clears throat> And of course, uh, Frank and Julie, I've known for a few years now, and uh, consider them a great inspiration and encouragement in my own life and work. <clears throat> uh, there was a Russian Orthodox bishop in Western Europe who was once given a doctorate by St. Sergius Theological Academy. <clears throat> and um, when he received it, he said, uh, I believe that you are giving me uh, this uh, honorary degree, not honoris causa, but amoris causa, <laughs> which means in Latin not uh, as honor, but as an act of love, charity, and kindness. And that's how I understand my being invited here today, much more as an act of charity to an old man. Uh, <laughs> uh, and to, uh, uh, if there's any honor, it's the, uh, to be honored to be part of this. So God bless you, keep you for many years, and uh, uh, I just hope that uh, all of this can continue very well. Um, my uh, modest presentation tonight uh, will be about early Christian worship and Orthodox Church worship actually to the present day. Because the Orthodox Church worship to the present day was pretty much um, uh, how can you say, its foundations were completed uh, very early in Christian history. Uh, I asked uh, George about what do you mean by early Christian? And we decided that for tonight it would be through the Seventh Council, through about the eighth century. Uh, and this is, this is the time when uh, the foundations of Christian worship uh, were um, for the uh, were established and here I would dare to say that the early church's foundation of worship based on the Bible that's what I want to try to show today how it's rooted in the Holy Scripture and particularly the law the Psalms and the prophets of the Old Testament uh, christened you know messianized eschatologized uh, this is I think very important for us to understand um, and to realize so I'm going to try to just share with you the conviction that early Christian worship and Orthodox Church worship in its origins uh, is the worship of God that God commands in the law of Moses <laughs> and in the Psalms and in the prophets, which according to the scripture was to be kept until the end of the age, was to be kept forever. The worship conditions of the Torah, what you find in the Psalter, and how the prophets of Israel are relating to worship relative to uh, the keeping of the law and, and believing in uh, the one true God, Yahweh, the Lord, Elohim. Uh, and how, what happened since the Christ has come and since the law, the Psalms, and the prophets have been fulfilled in him, uh, what happens then to worship? And what happens to worship uh, in the communities, the Kahal Israel, the Assembly of Israel, that is the, the assembly in the Messiah, the Church of Christ. Uh, how does this relate to, to uh, what went before and how was it developed uh, within, within the Christian history in the earliest uh, time? Uh, here, uh, for the sake of uh, full disclosure, uh, this expression from shadow to reality it's actually take, it's a title of a book by a Jesuit patristic scholar named Jean Danielou, where he shows that the prefigurations, the, the types, um, the shadows that were in the law as the pedagogos to Christ are completely and totally fulfilled in Christ. And in Christ then you move from the shadows, the, the prefigurations, um, the paraboli, the parables that the Old Testament has, and it finally, all of this comes to its fulfillment in Christ. 
which means that every single word of the Law, the Psalms, and the Prophets is about Christ. <laughs> it's all about Christ. The Psalms are all about Christ. The worship of the Torah with all that it prescribes, as I'll try to show very simply and superficially, is ultimately fulfilled and it's about Christ. And that the, 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 the Christian church understands itself to be the Israel of God. You know, it's interesting that in scripture you have the new covenant, right? Keni the Athiki, new covenant. You have the new heaven, you have the new earth, you have the Keni uh, Ktesis, the new creation, you have the new human, you have the new song. But there's no new Israel. There's one Israel of God. And Jesus is the Messiah of Israel who exists for the sake of the salvation of the whole creation. Now, in the, in the, in the Bible, because that's what we want to, I want to keep focusing on this tonight, um, you, you have in the end of St. Luke's Gospel, uh, the meeting uh, at Emmaus with Jesus, with Luke, and traditionally Cleopas and Luke, the two, and at the breaking of the bread, uh, uh, he opened their minds to the understanding of the scripture. And then he explained to them how the law, the Psalms, and the prophets speak about him, how it's all about him. And therefore, if that's true, then the worship of the law, Psalms, and the prophets are also ultimately all about him and are fulfilled in him, and that's how the Christians worship. Uh, and I already used that expression that um, the Christian faith worship, the Israel of God in the Messiah, in Christ, uh, is... Uh, the perfection that comes to it is that of messianization, christening, so to speak, and as we'll see, what we can call in fancy language, eschatalization. Es it, it projects it to the future coming kingdom of God. So I'm gonna just try to show uh, uh, by examples, very simple examples, how this worked, how it worked itself out. Um, and here uh, I would also, um, uh, uh, refer in, in the New Testament scripture uh, to the meeting of Jesus with the Samaritan woman in the gospel according to St. John. You know, in the Old Testament, that one of the types in the Old Testament is um, the man meets his bride at a well. <laughs> you know, uh, the Lord Isaac uh, uh, goes to get the wife for him and meets her coming to a well, and they talk about drinking the water. Jacob and Rachel is the same. Moses and Sephora is the same. So there's a sense in which, uh, and this would be a kind of an example of how, how this reading is done, that Jesus, as the divine bridegroom, is actually meeting his bride at that well in Samaria. Because who is his bride? His bride is the sinful, fallen, corrupted world. That's who his bride is. And you can't get more than that if you've got a Samaritan woman on her fifth man, you know, uh, and she's a heretic and a dog as far as the Jews are concerned. But it's interesting that when they meet, they have a conversation and she asks him, uh, where should we worship? On Mount Gerizim here in Samaria, or you Jews say in Jerusalem? And we all know what Jesus said to her. He said, uh, the hour is coming, it is, when neither on Gerizim nor in Jerusalem uh, will the worship be, but it will be the worship in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit. And not, he doesn't say a spirit, by the way. Spirit means it's not connected to a place. Uh, and, and that is all fulfilled now in the Messiah. And, and therefore, we could say, and I would definitely say, I have a series of podcasts on the radio about this, that we would believe that Christian worship, as the fulfillment of the Law of the Psalms and the Prophets, uh, is, in fact, um, the worship in spirit and in truth that God the Father desires from his people, and that his people do on behalf of the whole of humanity and the whole of creation. That's their task, uh, to, to intercede, uh, to glorify, to thank, to praise, to witness uh, on behalf of all and for all, as the line would say in the Byzantine uh, liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Also, I would just mention by way of introduction here, uh, the first sermon ever preached in Christian history uh, on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets out on the street, it's in the book of Acts, and he says that this Jesus who was crucified, God has made both Christ and Lord, and he is raised and glorified, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, 
And by the way, if you like trivial kind of things, the most repeated text of the Old Testament and the New is the first line of Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put all the enemies under your feet. And of course, the gospel, the glad tidings that, uh, of God, God's gospel in Jesus, is the gospel of the victory of God over all his enemies put under the feet of Jesus, his son, and those feet are nailed to the cross. <laughs> Uh, and very often the cross itself is called the footstool that the enemies are going to be put under. Uh, and, and so Peter says that this has come to pass. It's now here. Uh, and then a voice from the crowd says to him, cries out and says, what then should we do? What then should we do? If, if this Jesus who was crucified according to the scriptures and had to be crucified, and by the way, that would be a conviction of the early church and Eastern Orthodox tradition, there was no other way for God to redeem, save, sanctify, glorify, and deify the world except by the incarnation of the Devar Yagle, the word of God in human flesh to die the most vile death on the cross that any human, and especially a Jew, could possibly die. In other words, the cross is the center, the cross is essential. And here I would say in ancient Christianity and in Orthodox traditions, all theologia is ultimately stavrologia. Every word of God is a word of the cross. <laughs> It's the word of the cross. And so the cross and the crucified Christ raised and glorified, that is the center of Christian worship until the Lord returns again in glory. Now, um, so Peter says, what then, should, what, what then should we do? And Peter answers, believe, repent, and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you will receive the Spirit of God. And here, and that means that the kingship of God will be here. So, you change your whole way of looking at reality. You, you trust in the gospel of God. Be baptized doesn't mean be swished through water. It means to die with him, to be co-crucified with him, and to be raised and to live by the spirit of God, who, according to Paul, is the Aravon, the foretaste of the coming kingdom. And as the early, some early church fathers, like Athanasius, uh, in his letters to Serapion, uh, uh, um, Basil, in his treatise on the Holy Spirit, would say that the, the king of the kingdom is Christ, as we know on the Wheaton campus. <laughs> but the kingship is the spirit of God. <laughs> the spirit of God is the kingship. And Christ is the anointed and the spirit is the chrism. Uh, and the one true God's truth is Christ. The living God's life is Christ. And the spirit is the spirit of truth and it's the life-creating spirit. So you have a, a, a worship that's actually taking place, so to speak, very clearly within the Holy Trinity, within the Godhead. And, and those who believe in Christ are baptized in him and are in this worship in spirit and truth are actually worshiping within the very deity itself, which is the, which is, uh, uh, the only God that there really is. The one God and the true God is the Father of Jesus, but Jesus himself is God from God, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, rests in the Son, and so you have the mystery of the Holy Trinity as the very matrix and foundation of how the, the Christian worship goes on, the worship in spirit and in truth. Now, one last uh, remark here is that when Peter says this, <clears throat> he adds, a couple verses later, it's the second chapter of the book of Acts. He adds that, and those who believed and were baptized, it said they continued steadfastly in, and he names four things. Four things. <clears throat> that they continued steadfastly in. <clears throat> The teaching of the apostles. He did a kiton apostolon. The teaching of the apostles. They continued steadfastly in the communion. He kinonia. They continued steadfastly in the classis tuartu, the breaking of the bread. And they continued steadfastly in the prayers. Now notice, there are definite articles in every one of them. It didn't say fellowship, praying. It said 
the teaching of the apostles, definite teaching, the communion, and the church is the communion within the communion of the Trinity itself that we are taken into in the raised and glorified Christ with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us as the guarantee and the foretaste. It says the breaking of the bread, and that here it means the Eucharist itself, although in modern orthodoxy there's another service called the breaking of the bread. That's not it. This means they continued in it on every Lord's day, and the prayers, which means that this pre-existed the people's coming in, and that's a very important a principle of early Christianity, I believe, and certainly Eastern Orthodoxy, and that is this. We do not create worship. It's given to us by God. It's divine. It's revealed. It's shown forth for what it is, and it's there, it's there waiting for us to enter, and we enter into it and make it our own. Therefore, the, the liturgy of the church, and the word liturgia means a common act, a common act of, 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 of all the believers together. It's an act of the church itself, the kahal Israel itself. And in the Old Testament, the kahal was not the assembly of God unless the Lord himself was there present and governing and presiding over the assembly. That's why in the, in the, uh, in the traditional the Eucharistic liturgy of the Eastern Orthodox Church, it begins by the deacon saying to the bishop, it is time for the Lord to act. Bless master. It's the Lord who is acting there, and we enter into that action. And that's such a common teaching. For example, a great Western Orthodox uh, teacher of, of worship, uh, Benedict of Nursia, he said, when you worship as the church, when you worship as the church, you don't put, you don't put your mouth where your mind is. You put your mind where your mouth is, and the words are given to you to say they're given by God. St. Anthony the Great says, we worship God in words that the word himself provides, that God himself provides for us. And so this is, this is an element of the final covenanted community of the worship in spirit and in truth. So this is, uh, this is uh, what, we, what we see here in the, in the New Testament. Jesus is known in the breaking of the bread. He shows how the law and the Psalms and the prophets are all about him, uh, that... Uh, this is the worship in spirit and in truth that the world has been waiting for in the Messiah when the end of the ages has come upon us, which it has since Jesus is crucified and the spirit is poured out, and which is um, also uh, witnessed to in the first sermon ever preached in Christian history by the Apostle Peter on, on the streets of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So this is, this is it. And here I would say um, just one more little introductory remark. You can see how disjointed this is. Um, the two New Testamental books, writings, which are the most pertinent and important for the subject that we have tonight, they're all important, obviously, you know, everything is there, but I think that we cannot really appreciate what we're going to try to do tonight without a very thorough understanding of the letter to the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews which in Eastern Orthodox tradition is read at every single liturgical service during the great Lenten season, <laughs> leading up to Easter, leading up to Pascha. The letter to the Hebrews, because it has to do with Christ as God's son, the final prophet, the great high priest, the only priest who offers himself as the victim to the Father in the Jerusalem, not made by hands, above the heaven, behind the veil, offering his own self and body as to sacrifice to God, and that we do that together with him. And, and what is said in that book it becomes, it will become very practically important in what happens when Christians are formulating their worship in the earliest church. The other main liturgical book in scripture, New Testament scripture, and, and it is certainly a liturgical book, in my opinion, is the Apocalypse of John. The Apocalypse of John, where you have the image of the celestial liturgy, the presbyters, he who sits upon the throne, the lamb who is slain, Jesus as Logos word, Jesus as our Neos lamb, 38 times, uh, and uh, sitting before the throne of the Father uh, with all the angels and all the saints and those in their white garments and singing holy, 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 and so on. That, that is a kind of the ultimate apocalyptic eschatological vision of what you find already prefigured in Isaiah, for example. 
uh, Daniel 7, uh, the boys in the furnace, and so on. So it all comes together. So what I'd like to do is just to make some comments, very, like I said, simple, simplistic comments on um, how, does, how does this work? How does this work? And I just have a few headings, and I'll make a few comments under the headings, and then we can talk about what you would like to talk about. First of all, you ask this question, the place of worship. The place of worship. Now, here you have in the Old Covenant the shrines. You have the agricultural deities with the sacrifices that predated the Feast of Yahweh. Then you have the Yahweh Feast, which were first agricultural and cosmic. Then they're connected with the activities of God in history, uh, uh, particularly with the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, uh, um, uh, all through uh, um, uh, the Old Testament. Um, and then you have the, the um, um, uh, lost my, uh, yes. Then you have the building, uh, you have the tabernacles in the wilderness and how that tabernacle was built, how the sacrifices should be done, what the priest should wear, who the priest would be, the Levitical priesthood, Aaron, all this kind of thing. It's all biblical. And for those who are supposedly biblical, this is crucially important to understand Christian liturgy. You can't understand it without it, because all this was fulfilled. It wasn't done away with. It was fulfilled. So you have, you have uh, the, the place. And then, of course, you have the Jerusalem temple. And then it becomes crucial that this temple is destroyed after Christ is raised and glorified, not to be rebuilt again. And here in this tradition, Jerusalem, according to the apocalypse, is the place where Jesus was crucified and it's equal to Sodom and Egypt. How about that one? And the Jerusalem of the Christian is nowhere on earth. It's the Jerusalem which is above, which is our mother. The Jerusalem that's coming as a bride at the end. And that Jerusalem is everywhere where the people are gathered together in Christ by the Spirit, baptized under the leadership of an apostle or one who has been uh, received the laying on of hands from the apostle as the heads of the community. You have that already witnessed in the New Testament. The episcopi, the bishops, presbyteri, the elders, the diaconi, men and women, servants, the widows, the virgins. There's a community, a kachal, an assembly uh, that, is, that is governed and led by the Lord himself from heaven, seated on the throne, uh, which, uh, which is uh, given to us, and it is not connected with any particular place. In fact, we were talking at the table today and talking with the students. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa's name came up a lot. Gregory of Nyssa has one of the most fantastic harangues against pilgrimages you ever want to read. He said, for Christians, there's no holy places on this earth. This is the place where Christ was crucified. And, that, and therefore, he's spirit and he's worshipped everywhere. But the Christian worship takes place where the Christians are. So the place of Christian worship is the Christian community. It's the church. That's what it is. The church is the living temple. Each individual member and the church as a whole, built on the apostles and the prophets, Christ the cornerstone. Uh, so the temple where uh, this takes place is the community of believers. It's the kinonia agapis kepistios, as Ignatius would say. It's the union, the henosis of faith, and truth and love of those who have died to this world, are alive to God, are already belonging to the coming kingdom to come, and they gather together, and where they gather together, and formally gather together under their, under their uh, uh, leadership that comes from the apostles, that's where worship, liturgical worship, takes place. Now, people can pray everywhere, they worship everywhere, and so on, but tonight we're talking about liturgical worship, right? the worship of the community as such, the Christian church as such. Now here, I'm going to make a remark later on uh, about how, what happens when Christians start building buildings. <laughs> but one thing I want to say right now, because it just burned in my heart there, I, I think it's totally wrong when Orthodox Christians call their church buildings temples. That's become kind of commonplace now. We're building a new temple. There is no Christian temple. 
There can be a house where the church gathers, and they developed and they were also became part of the, the witness about Christian worship. We'll get to that later. But here we want to see that the place is the Christian community, and it could be anywhere. It could be in a catacomb. could be in the house churches uh, described in the New Testament and so on. Then it could be in some magnificent cathedral built by Constantine or whatever, but it's where the Christians are. And we will, I will mention later how in the Byzantine tradition for a consecration of a building for worship, the consecration patterns a baptism and a chrismation of a Christian person. You treat the building like a person. You baptize it, you dedicate it to God, you anoint it with chrism, and then it becomes a manifestation and a witness as the place which is set aside for the people to gather and where the bishop's chair would be. And already in the beginning of second century, before the year 110, St. Ignatius of Antioch said, there where the bishop is, there let the people gather, just as where Christ is, there is the Catholic Ecclesia, the Catholic Church. It's the first use of the term Catholic, which by the way is qualitative, not quantitative. It doesn't mean spread out. It means nothing missing, full, complete, total, perfect, as it can be in this age before the parousia, before the coming of Christ. That's what Catholic means. It means whole. It's where you get the expression okay, for example. Holy kala, you know, everything's right. So, <laughs> katholon means according to the whole. And wholeness and newness is our words. Wholeness, fullness, and newness are words which are repeated again and again about the Christian church, the Christian faith, the Christian teaching, and the pages of the New Testament, all fulfilling what is in the law of the Psalms and the prophets and not disconnected from them and not understandable without them. So this is what we want to say about that, but I'll speak a little bit later about the building. Now, what about the time? The time. Now, of course, worship in the heart and so on. Uh, you have ceaseless prayer. Uh, praying is worshiping, petitioning, whatever, giving glory to God. And Christians personally, individually do that. But what about the gathering of the church? What about the kahal, the assembly? When does it gather? You see, when does it have its official, so to speak, prayer as church? And here, uh, in the earliest church, the consecration of time, and here we want to see very definitely that in the development of worship in the Bible, you go from cosmic to historical to eschatological. <laughs> it begins in places, agricultural gods, agricultural feasts, then they are given economic meaning of the actions of Yahweh within his people, and then they are ultimately fulfilled in Christ, uh, and then they are ultimately an icon of the coming kingdom. Here, uh, an early Christian father, Maximus the Confessor, he's anyway, you know, seventh century, very interesting man, by the way. He was not ordained, he was a layman, he was a monk, uh, he took on the whole episcopate and the, and the whole Christian church by saying what they taught was wrong. They said they're not preaching the gospel, they're not teaching the gospel. They cut his tongue off so he couldn't speak. They cut his arm off so he couldn't write. They threw him in prison where he died. That's what usually happens to the church fathers, by the way. They always die in exile. Chrysostom died in exile. Stu died in exile. Maximum died in prison. You know, That's part of the story, folks. I mean, uh, that's how it works. Um, but in any case, before they cut his tongue off and cut his arm off, he said and wrote uh, that the old covenant to the new is as prefiguration or type or parable um, to uh, the old is a prefiguration or parable to the new. But then he said the worship and the life and the teaching of the new covenant is not a type or prefiguration or shadow of what is coming. He used the term ikona. It's an icon of the future, which means that it's already fully present there in the sacramental mysteries that you can experience while still in this world by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within the Church of Christ, which is the Catholic Church, the fullness of him who fills all in all, the best definition of the church you find in Scripture. It's the uh, last line of the first chapter of the letter to the Ephesians, which is the most ecclesiological book in the New Testament. So the church is here. So what does the church do? Well, very quickly, how does it sanctify the time of this world until the Lord comes in glory at the end? How does it do it as the church of Christ? Well, what developed, and it's taken right from the Old Testament, is 
that you have the hours of the day. The first unit of time is the day. Evening and morning, one day. And it begins in the evening. That's Genesis, right? Evening and morning, one day. Evening and morning, uh, you know, the second day and so on. So this day, Yom, is not, uh, it's not a chronological uh, thing. Even in, in Genesis, it is not. It means a completed act. So you have the day, but you have the 24-hour day. And here what development following the, the, um, the Old Covenant, for example, in Psalm 119, verse 164, you have the line, seven times a day will I praise thee for thy righteous judgments. Seven times. Seven is a symbolic number for, for, for fullness. So each day you have seven liturgical offices, and they're generally called the services of the hours. They begin in the evening. The first is Vespers. Then there's the after-dinner service, called in English for some reason Compline. I never could figure that out. In Greek, it's apodipnon, which means after the meal. Then you have the vigil through the night that ends in the morning with lauds. That's the evening vigil, which is normally called matins, ending in the morning, beginning in the dark. And then you have the first hour, the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour, which are early morning, six, nine o'clock in the morning, noon, and three in the afternoon. Then the cycle begins again the next day. Now, in the liturgical uh, uh, offices of the earliest church, and in, in the churches that still keep these things, you have the church celebrating these offices every single day. And it's, it should be done by everybody, even if you're not going to the church. And here you would have the Lord's Prayer replacing the Shema Israel that had to be repeated. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, he is one, the Lord, uh, 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 Adonai Eloheinu, the Lord is God, uh, Adonai Yachad, the Lord is one. And by the way, that doesn't mean numerical one. It's the same word that's used in Genesis for the two will become one. It's very important. Uh, and uh, and uh, then you will wor we will worship him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. There's no mind in Deuteronomy, by the way, six. There is in the New Testament because it's for Greeks. <laughs> um, um, you know... <laughs> It's added. But the heart in the scripture meant the mind, the will, and everything. It wasn't an effective organ. It was the center of the person's being. Soul, nefesh, meant your behavior, your life. And strength did not mean going to the gym. Strength meant your money, your possessions, your power, and everything that you have. You love God with that. Now, when the Christians come, they, they pre preserve that. That's the greatest commandment in the law. However, even there you have a fulfillment because the new commandment, is that not simply that you love God with all your mind, soul, heart, and strength, you love your neighbor as yourself, but the new commandment of the Messiah is, you shall love the Lord your God as I have loved you, which is the love of God himself who is love through the son of his love by the Holy Spirit who pours forth his love into our hearts. That's divine perfection and that is deo that's deification. That's theosis. That's what it is. It's not about lights or visions or something. It's about loving with the love that God himself is, that's given to us in Christ and the Spirit, which is human perfection. So you could say here, when you just look at the prayers of the hours, that you have two realities, two, two aspects, which are repeated over and over again in this worship tradition. One is the Psalms. All of these services are, the main words are the Psalms, the Psalter. And the Psalter is, prob is providing, you know, 75% of the words at ancient Christian liturgy and in Eastern Orthodox liturgy to this day. Now, later, you have these hymns being written and so on, and they didn't come in that easily, by the way. The monks opposed these kantakia, troparia, and so on. They said, there's no more penance left, there's no more repentance, there's no more tears, there's just songs, you know, uh, by men, you know. So, still, the, the Psalms are basic. But then these psalms are chosen for particular purposes of those times of the day. Evening psalms, morning psalms, psalms of the early hour. Ninth hour psalm has to do with the pouring of the Holy Spirit. The sixth hour with the betrayal of the Christ. The ninth hour with his crucifixion. Uh, that's how you pattern it. And, and, in, and in this tradition of worship, when you are reading the psalms, they are all about Christ crucified. That's what they're about. Every time it's about the Lord, the King, and so on, that's Christ. But every time it's about the lowly, the meek, the poor, the rejected, that's also Christ. That's also Christ. It's all about Christ. 
and, 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 and the Psalter is the Bible in miniature in a doxological worship setting. And we have to learn the Psalms. And in the Eastern Orthodox Church, that last Seventh Ecumenical Council, Canon number two says, no man can be consecrated a bishop in the church who cannot recite the Psalter by heart. So I used to have fun with the bishops. Because <laughs> they would say, we must keep the canons. I say, okay, let's hear it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, who sits not in the seat of the scoffer. You know, <laughs> let me hear the 150 Psalms, then say we'll keep the canons, okay? So, but the other is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. And the teaching always was, that's what everybody can use. And every believer baptized should have the Lord's Prayer seven times a day, according to these hours that you have the liturgical office. And when monks were illiterate or they couldn't read or so on, the Lord's Prayer and the Kyrie Eleison replaced it. So that's like the foundational prayer worship of the community and the individual member. And here I want to just say a word about the Lord's Prayer. I think it's just absolutely tragic the way the Lord's Prayer has been translated into English. What the Lord's Prayer is, is a total eschatological cry for the coming of the end of the ages by those who already have been crucified with Christ and belong to the age to come. What the Lord's Prayer says is, Abba, Father, who art in the heavens over everything, may your kingdom come, may your name be sanctified, may your kingdom come, may your will be done, and then it's hos en urano, as in heaven, in the risen and glorified Christ so also in us, his members on earth. That's what as in heaven, as on earth, as in heaven means. <laughs> I'm absolutely convinced of that myself. Then the next line is very, very important for our topic. We say, give us this day our daily bread. It's not daily. It's epiusios. Ton artonion ton epiusion dosi means simeron. Both in the Luke version and the Matthew version. It's only used... Only this place in the whole Bible. Nobody knows what it means. But somehow along the way, it came to mean, well, what you really need to live and so on. That's not what it means. It, it means literally the super substantial bread of the age to come, who is Christ himself. Here, read Isaac of Syria. Read John Cashin. That's what they say. Chrysostom already calls it bread. Someone just wrote me from Ancient Faith Radio and said, Father Thomas, Chrysostom said it's bread. I wrote back, Chrysostom's wrong on that one. And then it says, forgive us what we ought to do and what we owe, as we have already forgiven those who owe us and do not behave toward us as they ought. That's what it says. And then it says, lead us not into temptation is, a, is an idiom, which means do not let us falter or fall during the final temptation, trial, and test of the final tribulation that we are now in on earth since Christ was crucified and glorified. That's what the apocalypse is all about, not falling, not yielding. And that's what that petition in the prayer is. It says, but on the other hand, deliver us from the evil one. Every son of perdition, every man of lawlessness, every antichrist, and there are many antichrists, every demon and Satan himself. So. There's not one word for a happy, healthy life on earth in the Lord's Prayer. Not a word. And by the way, there's not a word about that in the entire gospel. <laughs> no name it and claim it there. The only thing you can name is to co-suffer with him. One of the early Christian hymns says, if we have suffered with him, we will, reign, we will reign with him. If we have died with him, we will live with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So this is what we have, and this is done these seven times a day. So in the church's liturgical worship, you have the assigned psalms and prayers for these seven times a day. And that's done just to the present day, and it's certainly done in monasteries. One of the things that I do criticize about the monks and nuns, and I'm a priest for nuns right now, is they, they're not very attentive to the times of day that, as they ought to be, you know. If monks and nuns can't keep these hours at the proper time, who can, <laughs> you know? Then you have the week, the week. Now, in the law of Moses, you had the Sabbath, the seventh day, 
the day when the Lord rested from, from all his work, right? In the Christian church, this is fulfilled. It's gone beyond. And the Saturday before the resurrection festival is the day when the Lord rests from all his work. When Christ lies dead in the tomb, that's the blessed Sabbath. And in this tradition, that day is kept holy all the time. It's a Eucharistic day. It's a liturgical day. There was a big controversy between East and West on this issue and so on. But, the, but it was kept. The Sabbath still has to be holy forever. Nevertheless, in Christ, the day is the Lord's day. Miaton Savaton, one after the Sabbath, which is called in the tradition from the Jews, not only the first day, but the eighth day, the seven plus one, the day of the coming age. And that's why the Christians gathered on the Lord's day to rehearse and to teach the gospel of the teaching of the apostles and to have the breaking of the bread and the communion and to do the prayers. So the day of worship for the Christians, and when you have things like keep the Sabbath holy, people think it's Sunday. It's not Sunday at all. That's Saturday. Sunday is the day of the coming kingdom, and, and that is the day when the Christians gather to uh, hear the gospel, sing the psalms, make the prayers, preach the, the gospel, revivify their faith, and then celebrate the Holy Eucharist, which is the sacrifice of their own self and their own bodies, together with the broken body and spilled blood of Christ, to God the Father, invoking the Holy Spirit, uh, so that um, God would then be glorified, and that there would be this possibility for communion with God himself through the crucified and raised Messiah by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the, on the people. And all of these things were controverted in history uh, for various reasons, various times, various explanations. But uh, this is what we would uh, say right now, that you have the week, and then there developed even particular themes for the days. Monday for the angels, Tuesday for John the Baptist, Wednesday for the Passion, Thursday for the Apostles, Friday for the Crucifixion, Saturday for the Sabbath rest, when death is being destroyed, when the Messiah dies, and then Sunday as the day of resurrection, the foretaste of the coming kingdom. So this is, this is how the Christians did it. Then you have the year, the year, when you speak about time. You have the day, you have the week, you have the year. Now, the center of the year is Pascha, it's the Passover. And of course, in the Old Covenant, it was done in remembrance of the deliverance from Egypt through the desert into the Promised Land, and then the, the giving of the land uh, by, by the Lord God, according to the promise made to Abraham, uh, to his people. Now, I already mentioned that these Paschal spring, it was a spring agricultural feast, the Pentecost was, there were others. Uh, but it was connected with the cosmos. Then it got connected with the mighty acts of God, the Magnalia Dei, how God acts. And so then the, the, this uh, Passover, in the, which is the spring uh, um, uh, equinox, it becomes when you celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ. It, end, it goes for a 50-day period and ends on the 50th day called Pentecost, which is 7 times 7 plus 1, 50. That it means it's also eschatological. It's also pointing to the future. And it's a, it's a foretaste of the coming age with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on those who belong to Christ who is risen from the dead. But Pentecost was a mosaic feast. Then you had tabernacles, which was booths. For the Christians, that became transfiguration of Christ because he was transfiguration, transfigured, according to the synoptics, at the Feast of Tabernacles. And by that time, the Feast of Tabernacles among the Jews was not simply an agricultural feast or, or it was already a time when there was looking forward to the time when the Messiah would reign and everything would be given free and you'd have bread and drink and water and celebrate with God without price and so on. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles was. And that's why Christ uh, is transfigured on the Mount, Transfiguration Mountain, revealing himself to Peter, James, and John, speaking with Moses and Elijah, who stand for the law and the prophets, for heaven and earth, Moses, Elijah's in heaven, Moses is buried. Stands for the living and the dead. Elijah's alive, who's supposed to proceed the Messiah from the heaven, which he will at the end, according to the fathers. John the Baptist does it for the passion. He's the new Elijah. Uh, and uh, and uh, 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 the living and the dead, heaven and earth, the law of the prophets. So everything is brought together there, and chiastically, that's the center of the synoptic gospels. Then it goes through to the end, until you then have the passion, the resurrection, 
and then uh, the revelation of Jesus as the Son of God, uh, risen from the dead, the Lord come in power, which the apostles themselves witnessed before they actually biologically died. Then you had the winter festival, the festival of lights, the rekindling of the lamps. That was done in the winter time at the solstice, the darkest day of the year. And then the Christians used that for the celebration of the incarnation and the revelation of the Messiah on earth. Originally, it was one festival, including Christmas, circumcision, temple dedication, and baptism in the Jordan, and the revelation of God in the flesh in this earth in, in the darkness of winter. And then the light shines in the darkness, the epiphania, the shining forth of God. Uh, and then they all became separate feasts as uh, Christianity developed. And then, Christ then Christmas was moved to the 25th of December because that was the Dies Natalis uh, Solis Invictu, uh, the, the sun under the pagans. So all of this was a consecration of the time of this world by the acts of God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament, and then their fulfillment in the person of Christ. And all this is kept in this church tradition until uh, the present day. So you have the day, the week, and the year celebrated by the, 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 the assembly of God's people uh, in the church as church at these particular times. And then with them, there developed fasting seasons to prepare. There were post-seasons of celebration, like Pascha goes on for 50 days. There are octaves, and it's sanctifying the life in this world in the light of the victorious Christ who is coming. And of course, the main Christian prayer was, come Lord Jesus. And it's, it's what's going to happen, not only what happened. Now, if we take a, a look at the, uh, at the celebration of the Lord's Day beginning with the Pascha Sunday, uh, we already mentioned that this is where Christ as the prophet and teacher, as well as the word and the disciple, Christ as the one great high priest and as the bread and the lamb who is sacrificed and offered, Christ as the priest according to the order of Melchizedek, because I mentioned that the most repeated psalm in the New Testament is 110, beginning with the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's the psalm where you have the line, thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was the king of peace, the king of Saban, came to Abraham, and everything is in that story. His sacrifice is bread and wine. Uh, the kings have been defeated on the earth. He eats together with Abraham uh, in this hospitality. Then the, 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 uh, the three men come there in the Genesis story. Well, all of this is fulfilled uh, in the Christian church, in the Eucharistic gathering, in the Eucharistic supper with Christ. And it's a command of God that this be done every Lord's Day. It's not if you want to have a communion service. It's not a devotion. It's an actualization of the church as church in space and time until the Lord comes again in glory. It's not negotiable. And it's certainly not a devotion, and it's certainly not a prayer service. But this is the way the earliest Christians worshipped. <laughs> this is how they did it. And that's how it, how it, how it developed uh, through history. And here again, I would just mention, um, again, reading this letter to the Hebrews. Read the letter to the Hebrews about the old Aaronic and Levitical priesthood, about the priesthood according to Christ, about the uh, entrance into the Holy of Holies not made by hands, eating and drinking in the kingdom of God. And the Eucharistic Supper is not simply a memorial of what happened in the past. It's a memorial of what is happening now in the risen Christ and will come at the end of the ages. It's, and Jesus himself, before he, uh, the Passion, he said, I will not eat and drink with you again until we eat and drink in the kingdom of God. Then how blessed are they who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And that bread will be Christ himself, the bread of life who comes down from heaven. So. This Eucharistic uh, uh, celebration, uh, it is the, the, the Christ as the teacher, Christ as the, the perfect disciple of the Father, Christ as the high priest, Christ as the Lamb of God who is slain, Christ as the king who is victorious, Christ as the suffering servant who, who is the subject of God, and it all comes together in him, and this is what is experienced in the worship of the church, which provides the context for exegeting scripture. It's the canon of faith by which you exegete scripture. There's no canon of scripture in this tradition. There's a canon of truth, a canon of faith that precedes even the uh, approbation of certain books and the rejections of others. And the books that have been sealed by this church tradition, 
are those that are centered on the passion of Christ, where the cross of Christ is the main revelation of God's glory on this earth and his love, and they are the affirmation of the old covenant scriptures. And that's what the pseudoepigrapha is not. And there's no magic in the New Testament. There's no boyhood stories. There's none of that stuff. It's all soteriological. It's all for our salvation, whatever the Discovery Channels say now and the History Channels and Elaine Pagels and you know, the others, Bart Ehrman, whoever. Um, that's not what it is. That's simply not what it is. You have the, 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 this a affirmation of these scriptures because they are fulfilling the Old Testament. How Paul, who had a vision, never speaks from the vision. He proves katatas grafas, according to the scripture, that Jesus is the Lord risen from the dead because that's what is foretold in the law of the Psalms and the prophets. That's, that's how it works. Uh, and then you don't boast in your visions, you boast in your suffering if you're a Christian. And he boasts for two pages long in the second Corinthian letter, right? So, uh, so this is, this is, uh, this is uh, um, how it's understood. And I think, you know, I was reading the, your first book that you published and so on, and from our perspective, my perspective, that would be one of the most great difficulties because you ask the question, what is the living context within which you're reading and exegeting scripture? Is it the library? Is it the latest scholar? Is it some holy man? Who is it? Well, it's nobody. It's the body of the church itself. It's the ongoing tradition of worship from the beginning where the early Christians christened, messianized, and eschatologized the law of the Psalms and the prophets and all of the uh, worship prescriptions of the law of Moses. That's what it is. Now, a, a very important thing here to uh, insist on is the Old Testament Levitical sacrificial system. You had thank offerings, praise offerings, peace offerings, forgiveness offerings, purification offerings, atonement offerings, mercy offerings, reconciliation offerings. Christians believe all these are fulfilled in the one offering Christ, hapax, once for all on the tree of the cross. And that's what the Eucharistic Supper is. It's a sacrificial meal. You're entering into the sacrificial death where he offers his body. And that body has at least four meanings all at once. It's the body of Jesus Christ himself, personally, that's broken and the blood is shed. It's the body of the believers who are having their bodies offered, broken, and shed with him. It's the body of the church, which is the body of Christ, right? Um, and it is also the bread and the wine that is offered where all of this is brought together, which is Christ, the church, the offerer. And as the prayer of the, of the liturgical office says, for you, O Christ, are the one who offers, the one who is offered, the one who receives the offering, and the very offering which is distributed to us. And if you go to the Holy Eucharist, not discerning the Lord's body and not discerning that you are to be members of Christ and therefore constitute his body in this world, which means you sacrifice your own body together with him uh, in the love for God and neighbor, then your communion is unto condemnation and judgment. It is simply not a Christian worship service. And here, the, the interesting, one interesting point on this, at least to me, uh, once I heard a person speaking, he says, very interesting, very interesting, very evident. Some guy raised his hand and said, interesting and evident to whom? <laughs> well, this is obviously interesting and evident to me. But St. Paul, in the letter to the Romans, he says, I beseech you and beg you, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your logiki latria, which is your spiritual, reasonable, human worship. So the worship, the sacrificial worship, is our offering our bodies, our whole life, with all we are with Christ to God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that we ourselves would become the body of Christ in this world. Now, sometimes, for example, in the sacramental theology, people will say, well, the church is the mystical body of Christ, but the bread and the wine, when it's consecrated, that's the real body of Christ. And boy, there was there controversies about that, right? But I would say in the earliest church and among the church fathers, just the opposite is what was taught. That the Eucharistic bread and wine is the mystical body of Christ. The real body of Christ are the baptized Christians. 
who are sealed with the Spirit and who are dying with him every day and gather every Lord's Day to renew their baptism and to offer themselves again to the Lord. And that's why there's no particular renewal of baptismal service in the tradition because it's done at every Eucharistic service. And that's why the creed is sung because you're affirming your baptism. And that's why it's sung in the singular, not in the plural, because each person there has to reaffirm it for themselves. And if you can't do that, you can't participate in the supper. Or if you do, it's onto your condemnation. You're just messing around with the holy things. So here, this logi ki latria, that expression is used in the earliest Christian prayers all the time for Christian worship. It's the human worship in spirit and truth that, that those who are together with Christ are offering to God in and through and with Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so this is, this is what, you, uh, what we have there. Now, one last thing here is about this house of the church. Uh, I said already that the temple is the people. It's not a building. And I think it's very wrong to call a building a temple. <laughs> Even Jews now call their synagogues temple. There was only one temple, and it's gone. And you know how in the Gospels, without getting into it, Jesus speaking about destroying the temple and raising it again at the Passion, the false witnesses, had had all to do with that point about the temple. The temple. However, in the earliest church, when Christianity was illegal, there were meetings at... Um, graves of martyrs, those who had really died with Christ and proved that they belonged to him. So they would celebrate this Eucharistic meal over their bones. And in our church to this day, we take a bone of a saint and put it on the altar table to keep that in, in mind. It's the blood of the martyrs and the great martyr, the faithful martyr according to the apocalypse is Jesus himself. That's where the Jehovah Witness get the name of their church or their movement. The Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, that witness is Jesus, and he is the martyr. Uh, but so, and then you had it in the homes, the church in the home of. And then the communities developed, leadership developed. By the time you get toward the end of the first century, you have pretty much the structures that persisted, at least in the churches of Catholic tradition, down to the present day. The bishop in each community, the chief presbyter, with the presbyterium, with the deacons, both men and women, uh, and with uh, the widows, the virgins, the faithful, each with his or her vocation, uh, gathered together um, in one body. And no one part of the body can lord it over any other part of the body, according to St. Paul, right? Now, but then, buildings started to be built. And you mentioned the anniversary of Constantine, and he starts building these buildings all over the place, and, uh, you know, uh, church buildings are built. And uh, here, I, I would just like to say that I believe that the way that the early Christians, uh, and that's already not so early because it's only at the time when they could build buildings, right? They consciously followed the tabernacle and the temple of the Old Testament as it's eschatologized in the Apocalypse and as it's described in the letter to the Hebrews. So if you go to a, a, a traditional Orthodox church building, it's a witness, and the Seventh Council will say this particularly, it is a testimony, a martyria, an apologia, a defense of the Christian faith itself in how it's formed, how it's shaped, and what is there. Now, let me just say a little bit about that. The building has to be a building that is conducive for Christian worship. So it has to show a forward movement an expectation, a high place, a sanctuary in the heavens, coming at the end of the age, uh, uh, as you would see described in the Old Testament prefiguration and in the letter to the Hebrews and the Apocalypse. In that particular building, so in other words, you cannot have a round Orthodox Church building, <laughs> I don't think, because that would not bear witness to Christian conviction. We're not in round cyclical things happening again and again and so on. History is there. We're looking forward. Come Lord Jesus. We're looking all together the same direction. And the celebrant should be looking the same direction too. Especially when he's blessing the people or distributing communion or preaching the word uh, and so on. When he preaches, he preaches from a high place. Because it's the word of God. It's not him. 
He's not sharing his thought, food for thought, whatever, walking around pretending he's Jesus on the streets of Capernaum or something. No, Jesus is speaking from heaven now. Read the letter to the Hebrews 12th chapter. You know, and so it's from on high. And very often in the earliest church, the bishop preached sitting on a cathedra, and the people stood and listened to him. And it was a high place behind the table of the, of the altar. Then you had a sanctuary area, which the traditional Christian church has, east and west. But I'll stick now to the eastern development. The sanctuary area had a kind of a, a clear separation from the nave. And it was showing forth, as Maximus would say, the coming kingdom. What we are expecting, what is going already now in the celestial liturgy, in which we expect to enter into fully at the end of the age, in which we enter into mystically and sacramentally in the sacramental mystical life of the church. So in, the, in that area, when they began to build, they would sometimes have a veil across because it was veiled, and then you took the veil away when you actually celebrated, so you had access through the veil, as it says in the letter to the, to the Hebrews. Uh, then you had an altar table. Originally, and in, in, certainly in the Russian church to this day, it's, it's got to be a cube. Because in the, in the temple, in the tabernacle, it was a, it was a cube. It was cubic. Uh, in the Old Covenant, you had on that table the tablets of the law, Aaron's rod that budded, and the manna that they ate in the wilderness. In the New Covenant church, you have on that table, besides the bone in the table of the martyr, you have the four Gospels, not the, not the entire Bible, not even the entire New Testament. You have the four Gospels because Christ is the Word of God. The Word of God for Christians is a person. It's not a book. And we don't read the Bible like the Koran. It didn't fall from heaven intact and so on. It witnesses to Jesus as the living Word of God. So in place of the tablets of the law, you have the four Gospels. A gospel book, usually decorated, that you can kiss it, venerate it, because it's the word of God. Then you have on the altar, in place of the Aaron's rod that budded, you have a cross that the celebrant blesses the people with at various times. Because that's the real, the real weapon of God's victory of the gospel, the cross of Christ. And then in a, in a, in a, in a tabernacle type of uh, vessel, you don't have the manna, the remnant of the manna, you have the Eucharistic gifts. You have the consecrated bread and wine from the Eucharist that are kept there for communing the faithful uh, if they're sick or they're suffering or so on, that, or in special times, uh, but that's what's on the table. This, this patterns completely the old covenant. Then you have a seven-branch candlestick, and according to the Orthodox rubrics, this would be a seven-branch candlestick, like in the Old Testament tabernacle. Now, one really interesting thing, at least I think it's a very interesting thing, is that in, as this iconography developed, in the, in the old temple, behind the altar, you had a place called the Hilastirion in Greek. The, it's translated into English, the mercy seat. And that was an empty space. And it was prescribed in the Torah to have two cherubs, two cherubim, a cherub on each side. But it was empty because God was invisible. God could not be seen. But that's where Moses spoke with God. And that's where God taught him. And only he could go there, sometimes Joshua, but this face-to-face -face meeting where Moses heard in the tabernacle God speaking as on the mountaintop. And that was where the encounter with God took place in, 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 the, in the temple. Now, in Eastern Orthodox churches, you may know that over the altar in the classical iconography, there's usually a huge fresco of the Theotokos, the mother of God, either in the Isaiah form with her hands up and Christ in her, or seated on a throne with Christ on her lap as the seat of wisdom. That's the Christian mercy seat. That's not the Theotokos. It's not a fresco of Mary. It's a, it's a witness to the conviction that the word has become flesh and we have seen him, we have heard him, we have touched him, he is speaking to us, and it's not empty anymore because God has become a man.
and he's been glorified. And he's born of the Theotokos and lived on the earth to teach us. And he teaches us what he heard from the Father from before the foundation of the world. So when people come in and they say, you know, I had people say, don't bring your evangelical friends to our churches. They'll come in and see that big thing of Mary and they'll say we're Mary Oliters and all that stuff. It ain't Mary. <laughs> and in the service books, she's called the mercy seat of the world. She's called the warm mercy seat, the living mercy seat, the alive mercy seat, the one where this redemptive activity, Hilastirion, takes place in the person of her son who has become visible. You can see him, you can touch him, you can taste him, you can hear him. And, and that was how the iconography developed. Then they're developed in front of the altar, what were called the local icons. Again, people will say, well, they've got Mary and Jesus on the same level in those Orthodox churches. What's wrong with them? Got news for you again. It ain't Mary and Jesus. They're icons of the first coming and the second coming. The first with the mother with the child, who looks like an older person, that's an icon of the incarnation. The other one is Christ alone in glory. That's the icon of the second coming. And everything takes place in the Christian church between the two comings. And it's always a remembrance and an expectation. That's what all worship is. Remembering what God has done and expecting what he will do and waiting for it and praying for it and calling for it to come. And then you had other things developed. You had the four evangelists put on the doors. You had the Annunciation put there because the center is the incarnation of the word, the center of Christianity. Then you had the apostles put there, the prophets put there. And then you had this explosion uh, of, uh, of, the, of the icons. Now, that was not a total universal practice uh, in the Christian early centuries uh, for many, many reasons, because of paganism, because of all kinds of things. But by the time you get to um, the fifth, sixth century, it becomes a witness to the faith because Jesus is not only the word of God, he's the icon of God. When you see him, you see God. Philip says to him, show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. He says, Philip, I've been with you so long, you still don't understand? He who sees me sees the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And then St. Paul will say that the same way that the Kabod Yagwe, the glory shown from Moses and Elijah, and they saw this, now it shines, apotu prosopu tu kiriu, from the face of the Lord, who is the icon of God. So Jesus is the icon of God. And that is the theological foundation. That's the evangelical foundation for the veneration of icons, for the propriety of painting uh, uh, the paintings of Christ, Mary, the sacred events, the saving events, the prophets, the apostles, because this is a revelation of God. And John of Damascus will say, if you deny it, you deny the Christian faith itself. We deny the Christian faith itself. And so there was a century under Islamic influence and so on, 120 years of iconoclasm. More martyrs died for the icons than in the early Christian era. <laughs> Terrible persecution, horrid. But they refused to simply step on an icon and say it's a piece of bread, uh, board. It's, you know, would you step on the Bible? I mean, would you, you know, so this conviction of, of the necessity for proclaiming, as the Seventh Council will say, the faith in words and images, that becomes an, an integral part of the Christian worship tradition. And so you have the hymns that are sung are what is depicted on the icon. So if you're looking at an icon of Christmas, you're singing the songs of Christmas, you're hearing the pericopes from Luke and Matthew, you see it in front of you also. Because it's historical, it happened, it's here, it's with us. And so here, it would not be negotiable in that sense. It would be true that it's not negotiable. People may not like it, but they can't be against it. Because if you're against it, the claim would be you're against the gospel. <laughs> you're against the gospel. And if it's there and if it's holy, you venerate it. You love it. You kiss it. You incense it. But more important than that, you use it as the canon of your own life. You live by it. You're judged by it. If you, if you kiss it, you've got to follow it. <laughs> if you kiss the cross, you've got to take it up. <laughs> And if you don't, you're in big trouble. But that the cross, the frescoes, the handiwork, all of that would become part of the whole worship tradition, which you had in the Old Covenant in great detail. Read how God prescribes the priest to be vested, how he's supposed to put on, what he's supposed to wear, who he's supposed to be, what pieces of, of, of linen and blue colors and all that are supposed to be used. And we would say, the ancient Christians would say, that is not all undone by Jesus. 
is not fulfilled to be rejected. It's fulfilled to be fulfilled and christened and, and used as a witness to the gospel until the Lord returns again in glory. So this, all, uh, this, uh, t- this house of the church, when they began to be built, were built in accordance with the convictions of what Christian worship is all about. And then, of course, in that community of the faith, you have that's where the baptisms are done, the chrismations, the Eucharist is celebrate, the weddings, the healing, the, the, the um, uh, interment of the dead. And in the Eastern tradition and in the early church tradition, a sacrament was not defined as an external act, giving internal grace, instituted by Jesus and found on the pages of the scripture. Then you discuss how many there were, seven or two or two and a half or how many. The Eastern and the early church never did that. They didn't think that Jesus came to the earth to institute sacraments. He came to bring the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, every aspect from before birth until after death is sanctified in the church of Christ by liturgical worship and veneration and, and, and uh, uh, reading the word of God and saying the proper prayers. So in our tradition, besides baptism and chrism and Eucharist and marriage and healing and reconciliation of penance and the order of the church, the bishops, the priests, the deacons, you have monastic consecrations, you have sanctifications and consecrations of everything that possibly exists. If it exists, you can bless it. And there's a prayer for it in the priest prayer book. Um, of all kinds, because the whole sanctification and deification of life is, is already seen for what it will be at the end and experience that way in the victory of Christ. So there's no counting of sacraments. You know, people think Orthodox are retarded because they don't know how many sacraments there are. Well, we would say that ain't what sacraments are, <laughs> and they're not there to be counted. <laughs> but that every aspect of the human life has its consecration through Christ and the Spirit to God, which is already an icon of the coming age, that is the truth. 